Hello, this is Dr. Mohammed, and this is design of steel uh, structures according to AISC compression members. This is part number five. And in today's video, I'm going to talk about the uh, mainly about three main points. I'm going to give some examples on using the alignment charts that we have already explained in the last video. And after that, I'm going to talk about the effective length of inelastic columns. And I'm going to give a couple of examples on it. And after that, I'm going to talk about the torsional and flexural torsional buckling mode failures of uh, columns. And I'm going to wrap up with the different types of mode failures of column. Okay, so let's go now to, uh, to the next slide and start with uh, examples on the alignment charts. Okay, so we have this example for now. Um, we have a rigid frame that is, as you can see here, this is the rigid frame. And in this rigid frame, we are going to uh, uh, like investigate the element or the column AB, the portion of the column, which is AB. And in this uh, frame, it is unbraised frame. So this frame is considered to be like moment frame or the sway is permitted. Each member is oriented so that the web is in plane of the frame. So I mean that the web is going to be in the plane of the frame, means that the strong axis in the plane of the frame. So they are like making something like this, for example. If we're going to take a cross section here, okay, this is the meaning of in the plane of the frame. So the web is in the plane of the frame. Determine the effective length factor Kx for columns A, B, and B, C. So we want to check the effective length factor Kx for A, B, and B, C. Everything is given for this uh, frame. As you can see, we have uh, the distances here or the spans 20 feet each here, and this is 18. And for the height, we have 15, 12, and 12. So, and also for the cross sections of the beams or girders framing into point A, they are known for us. And also the girders cross sections framing into point B, they are known. All of them, they are wide flanges. And also the columns above and below point A, and the same for point B. Everything is known for us. Okay, now let's start with uh, column. Um, uh, a, B, and start with the point A, joint A. So for joint A, we are going to calculate G, which is the ratio between I column over L column, the summation of I column over L column, over the summation of I girder over L girder. So here, if you are going to check it, you're going to find that I column we're talking about all the columns framing into this point, okay, point A. So we have white flange 12 by 96, and here white flange 12 by 120. So we can obtain these I, or the inertia, from the table, from the dimensions and properties table. Easy for us to obtain it. LC here is going to be 12 feet, as you can see. 12 here, 12 and 12 for the columns. For the beams, also these inertias, we can obtain it from the tables, and we have the length to be 20 and 18. So we have 20 and 18, which is this girder and this one. For joint P, for joint uh, B, we are going to follow the same, uh, the same procedure. We know the inertias from the properties table, and then we have L column, it is going to be 12 and 15. We have here, this is 12 and 15 because we're talking about point B. And IG over LG, it is going to be uh, already calculated before here in the point G, it is going to be the same. We're talking about <clears throat> the girders because the girder here and here, they are the same. And to the left, they are the same as well. So we are, uh, having the same number, okay, so it is repeated here. With the ratio, we can find that the GB is 0.95 and GA it is 0.94, okay. 
Then the next step is going to the alignment chart for side sway uh, like uninhibited, okay? We call this is unbraised or sway permitted. So this is based on AISC figure C-C2.4 with GA.94 and GB.95. So we can find KX equal to 1.3. Let's have this. Uh, so we are going to go to the alignment chart. As we said, we have side sway prevented here and side sway not prevented here. So we have two types. We are going to use this one. We are in the case of unbraised. Take care. We are in unbraised case. So this means that we are going to GA. So this is the point A and this is point B. So for GA, we have 0.95, so almost here. And then for GB, it is 10. So we're here. So if you are going to make a line, okay. So, oh, sorry. Sorry for this. <laughs> so if we're going to make a line from here to here, for example, I'm very sorry. It, uh, I cannot control the straightness of the, of the line because it's a little bit difficult. So anyway, you are going to find that the point that is intersects is going to be here, okay? So we are uh, going to have KX 1.85 almost here, as I, as I said, okay? So this is 1.85, okay, for our uh, our column, okay, for joint A and joint uh, B. From the alignment, from the alignment chart, I think that there is okay. Let me check something here. Okay, I think that there is, sorry, there is a mistake. I was talking about uh, joint or the element BC here. Okay, so actually we should use 0.94 and 0.95. Okay, this is supposedly to be the two that we are going to, to use, 0.94 and 0.95. And KX for this member is going to be 1.3. Let's go here and see. So 0.9 here, 0.9, uh, as we said, 0.95 and... 0.94 and 0.95 so 0.94 and 0.95 so we're going to have a straight line almost here so we're going to find this value as 1.3 right this is 1.3 yes that's right so we are we are here almost so we are here here so it is 1.3 this is for member a b okay this is for member or column a b we are going to repeat the same Okay, obtaining the same G4 uh, point B and C. Point B already we have obtained it before. So we know it, it's 0.95. And point C, it is hinged. So this means that our point, the, this point C, we're going to have G for it to be, to be 10. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry for this. For column BC, for joint P, as uh, as before, it is going to be 0.95 because we have calculated this, okay? And for point C, it is supposedly to be 10, okay? So G, C, supposedly to be 10. Then we are going to enter the alignment chart with G, Yes, I think there is a mistake here for in the, in the in the textbook. I think this is supposedly to be G B, and this is supposedly to be G C. Okay, so because we are talking about column B C, so we're going to find this in the textbook. So maybe it's a kind of, of, of mistake here. So we're going to use G B 0.95 as before, and G C going to be 10. Okay, so it is 0.95 here. And we have 10 here. If you are going to make straight line, sorry for this. As I said, I cannot control the straightness of the line. So here, anyway, it is going to be like 1.85. It is going to be 1.85. Okay. Remember that we are using side sway, not prevented or side sway permitted. So this means that our k is going to be larger than one. Okay, so only take care of this mistake in the textbook. Okay. Okay, so now this is the the example that we have uh, worked up till now. This is a side sway uh, permitted case. 
task let's go to another example and check it <clears throat> also it is going to be an example similar to the previous one where that we do not have any bracings here so we're going to use the alignment charts and we are going to obtain the values or at least we are going to have the values of GA and GB for the elements okay so first of all whenever that we have a, a frame like this we can make a table which is going to be easier for us if we're going to calculate GA and G uh, or the uh, G of the end of the columns for all columns in the structure then we can uh, make it in a table like this we can give numbers for the columns one two three four like put the member numbers here and including the girders five and six so it is five and six these five and six for girders and then <clears throat> we have uh, this is actually maybe part of uh, something or part of calculation b column this is the not needed here we do not need any uh, forces uh, here to be calculated and we are having the young's models that is given for us i we need to calculate it or we can obtain it from the uh, tables l is giving for us for each element or each member and then we are going to calculate i l whether it is for columns or for girders okay so we can put it in this easy way this is actually this example to like um, like train you to use whenever that you are going to use a frame with many columns here and there and you need to make like hand calculations or calculation sheet by your hand then it's better to use this kind of uh, beam then you are going to find that <clears throat> we have columns one and two they are pretty the same like the, similar we have like the bottom is going to be hinged means that g a is going to be like 10 and then point 0.3 and point 0.4 they are the same right they are the same so we're going to calculate it only once so for columns one and two this is why we put it under one title we can make it easy for us like the bottom is going to be g a is going to be 10 because pen connection is there in the foundation and in the top we have three and four they are having the same i column and girders because if you look <clears throat> to uh, member two one and three and two and four they are going to be if you look you are going to find that they are the same one and three so this is one and three sorry they are not the same this is 63 okay 63 like 0.4 and this is going to be 75 point uh, 0.4 okay one and three yes i mean that not they are not the same but one and three they are like equal to two and four two and four also 63.4 and 75.4 this means that member one and three they i and l like equivalent to member two and four so we are going to calculate it only once so we're going to say i column over l column which is 75 okay 0.4 plus 63.4 which is i column okay for uh, like column uh, one for example and this is for column uh, uh, three and then over i girder over l girder Okay, I girder over L girder, which is going to be 82.9, which is given here for us. Okay, this is for girder 5. Girder 5 is different than girder 6. So this can be calculated like 1.67, and we have GA to be 10. Okay, then we can from GA and G be going to the alignment charts, going to the alignment charts and then we can obtain the value of k okay you can do it as an assignment for you and for column three and four it is the same also column three uh, three and four which is which is this column and this one let's erase here everything so we have 
column 3 and column 4 also the top is girder 6 and the bottom is going to be girder 5 for for both of them and the vertical elements are going to be the column itself 4 and column 2 here and column 3 and column 1 here so we can calculate it also under one title they are going to be the same column 3 and 4 so we have GA for it is going to be 70 for I column over L column 75.4 plus 63.3 okay which is uh, like this is the columns column like 2 and 4 2 and 4 2 and 4 or for this column which is going to be column 3 and 1 so 3 and 1 they are the same I mean that the summation is going to be the same so GA is known GB is going to be the same because both of them they have the uh, girder 6 here right girder 6 and in the same time they both of them they have column 3 and 4 so we are having 75.4 for the columns column 3 and 4 3 and 4 they are the same 75.4 and 75.4 and for the column it is 26 okay because it is girder number 6 which is 26.5 okay so now we have GA and GB you can go to the alignment chart and get the value for K it's an assignment okay so now I think that it's pretty easy for us and simple that to use the alignment charts okay you're going to see whether that your frame is side sway prevented or side sway not prevented uh, according to the alignment chart and using the values of GA and GB you can get and enter get the value of k okay now let's talk about the effective length of inelastic columns okay what is inelastic columns the first question is well what is the inelastic columns we were talking about alignment charts for columns in general why now the word inelastic like uh, appeared okay simply because the this alignment chart that we were talking about they have been derived based on elastic columns so elastic column theory okay do you remember that we said that if we have like this is the we have two parts here part and the proportional limit we have here this is going to be like elastic okay and here is going to be inelastic right so this is the part this part this alignment chart works for however this part which is the inelastic no we need to calculate or derive another alignment chart so the point is we need to understand first why we need to study the effective length of inelastic columns okay first of all the alignment chart method was developed for elastic columns so it is it was for this part here okay this is for uh, elastic part however for the inelastic part which is this part here uh, we need to uh, for inelastic part we need to uh, like the alignment chart will provide larger value for the effective length this means that we're going to be like over designing our columns okay over designing because there are some parts of the column is going to fail by yielding not by buckling so we are having some like some uh, some part of the column is going to serve for resistance so we are supposedly to reduce the uh, the effective length or the effective length factor in this case is going to be larger if we use the elastic alignment charts so this leads to longer columns length and to conservative results for column strengths that's right we're going to use a very conservative it's not, not economic for us so the effective length factor k for inelastic columns can be approximated as follows we can approximate it in uh, in a way that is going to be easy for us to calculate the the idea is that we are going to use factor called stiffness reduction factor 
this stiffness reduction factor is going to be used or going to uh, multiply the fictive length factor in order to reduce it so that's the the idea that we're going to use something called tau a for example and we are going to multiply it by our k which is the elastic effective length elastic effective length factor and then that's it this is how we can like overcome this problem for for us okay so let's go now and understand what is the background or rational behind this actually for gn elastic okay which is the ratio between the uh, summation of inertia of columns and beams uh, here for the column the point is we are using et because we are in the inelastic range right so this et is going to be different than e which is the young's models of the steel that is going to be used for i girder right because again we are in the elastic range means that the uh, if you remember that this is the point if we are going to have the stress strain curve we are in the point here okay we are here a point that is differentiating between the elastic part and inelastic part here we are going to use e tangential however here we are using e only right so g inelastic needs to take into consideration the tangential young's models so if we say that everything is going to be <clears throat> the same then we are going if we say that this is going to be the ratio for the elastic case right this is for the elastic case as we have done before and then et over e we do not know it it's something new for us we do not know because we do not know et so we're going to to give this a designation like this tau alpha times g elastic okay so now g n elastic is going to equal to tau alpha times g elastic that's how we are going to use okay then we're going to try to find a way to make a relation here if you remember we have et over e times g elastic look to this et over e we are going to multiply the numerator by pi squared over l over r squared and the numerator with the same value pi squared e pi squared over l over r squared then this numerator is going to be what exactly the uh, critical critical buckling strength in the inelastic range because we use et here right and the numerator it is going to be the critical buckling length for the elastic case because we use e right so the ratio between the two actually is going to be what et over e right which is going to be tau alpha so this means that tau alpha let's erase everything here and go back so g in elastic equal to tau alpha times g elastic so now we want to know how to get this t or tau alpha okay this tau alpha is going to be simply it is going to be according to what we have derived here it is going to be the ratio between the critical buckling in inelastic range over the critical buckling strength in the elastic range if we could know these two we can obtain tau alpha and from tau alpha we can multiply by g elastic and then we can obtain the g n elastic you understand this is the story of of this part this is the story of the tau alpha and how to obtain g n elastic from g elastic so the point is our intermediate step is how to calculate the fcr n elastic and fcr elastic we want to calculate them if we could calculate then everything is going to work for us okay now let's go and see how lrfd or how asic was making this approximation to work okay so asic uses an um, approximation for the inelastic portion of the column strength curve do you remember so equation 4.13 Okay, which is this equation okay this equation 
okay, is an approximation when AISC equation E3-2 and E3-3. Do you remember these equations? We have explained them in the previous videos. Are used for FCR, and that's right. We can approximate FCR, the critical buckling strength, by compressive strength. That's the assumption that we're going to work with. FCR, we are going to equate it with compressive strength. So what is the meaning of this? For LRFD, we're going to assume that FCR is going to equal P ultimate, which is the load that we are going to apply, going to apply on the element, over phi C times area gross. And if we're talking about ASD, it is going to be omega C times the actual load or the applied load over area gross. Okay, again, this is the trick that we are going to use. We are going to say FCR is our applied load. It is our applied load or ultimate load if we are talking about LRFD. Then in the, in the elastic range, we are going to assume that FCR in elastic okay, is approximately, this is an approximation for LRFD, if we are talking about LRFD, P ultimate over phi C area gross okay, equals to 0.658 raised to the power F yield over Fe okay, times F yield. So now we know P ultimate, this is the required ultimate strength. Phi C, we know it, okay? It is the resistance factor, reduction, reduction resistance or the resistance factor, K.9, okay, for example. Area gross, we know it for our cross, cross section. A field that is known, a field here and the power is known. Now the only one that is we do not know is Fe. Everything is known in this equation, then we can get Fe, okay? Similar, this is if we are talking about LRFD. If we are going to talk about ASD, then we are going to use the same approach. Omega C is known for us. P A, it is going to be the actual load. A G, it is the area gross. We know it. Everything here is known in the right hand side except for exactly F E. F E is not known for us. So we can obtain it. So we can obtain F E. So after obtaining Fe, how, what we are going to do, then we are going to get FCR elastic. FCR elastic equals to 0.877 times Fe, which is already obtained from the previous step. Then this is FCR elastic. We are having now the two main uh, like uh, numbers or values needed for tau, right? Remember that tau alpha equals to ex exactly g n elastic over g elastic which equals to as we said before t alpha or t a it is equal to f c r n elastic over f c r elastic right so from here let's go to the next step we are going to know what is the main steps that we should follow in order to get this tau alpha. First of all, approximate the inelastic buckling strength okay, by the compression stress. That's the first step. So we're going to say FCR inelastic equals to P ultimate if we're talking about LRFD, of course, over phi C times area gross. Then from this, we are going to get, after that, we're going to get FE by saying FCR equals to P ultimate over phi C over area gross times this approximation from according to AISC. This is the only unknown here is Fe. Then we are going to obtain Fe from here. Okay. Then compute FCR n uh, elastic, sorry, elastic using the Fe obtained from here. Then FCR elastic is going to be 0.877 Fe. Then our tau alpha or tau A it is going to be FCR n elastic that already we have assumed from the beginning based on the required strength over FCR elastic, which is already calculated. Okay. Then at the end, G in elastic is going to equal tau alpha times G elastic. Okay. Do you understand this step? If uh, these steps, if you do not understand it, please stop the video and look again to this uh, like this flow 
or these steps you're going to find that they are coherent the only the only thing that we have assumed in the beginning that fcr inelastic is going to equal to the compressive stress that's it then we go through the remaining uh, steps okay now this tau alpha actually it is provided in the manual so it is provided for us if you go to table 4-21 so please stop the video now and go and bring your manual and check this table, table 421. We have tables from 4-1 to 420. This is the tables related to the column and then table 4-22 also related to the columns. But 4-21 it is related to the stiffness, we call it the stiffness reduction factor, tau alpha or tau A. And this is the meaning of tau alpha. It is the ratio of the tangent modulus E, tangential or ET, to the elastic modulus E, as we have explained um, many times before. Okay, it is this is what tau alpha is all about. Okay, E tangential over E uh, elastic or FCR inelastic over FCR elastic. Okay. Okay, now this is the table that you can find in the manual, table 4-21. This is only one, uh, this is the table here, it's one page table as you can see. And it is given ASD and LRFD based on PA over area gross or P ultimate over area gross if we're talking about LRFD. And F field, it is in KSI and given for 35, 36, 42, 46, and 50. Okay. That's it. This is what they are providing, actually. Okay. And then you are going to find this hyphens here or dashes. This indicates stiffness reduction factor is not applic uh, applicable because the required strength exceeds the available strength for KL over uh, R. Okay. Okay. So this is the case for, for us uh, here. And this is the table that you can find that is provided for ASD and LRFD. The values are provided, as you can see. That not all the values are provided, actually. I mean that this is because all of them, they are, as I said, the, this hyphen indicates due to uh, values that is not available here. So, and this is the, like, PA over area gross or P ultimate over area gross available. And you can get from here the tau alpha directly okay okay now let's have an example and see what we are going to use uh, how to can how can we use what we have learned up till now okay so here it is um, compute the stiffness reduction factor tau alpha for an axial compressive stress of 25 ksi so this is compressive stress given Okay, axial compressive stress. So we're talking about like, this is P ultimate here, okay, over the area gross. It is given for us, which is 25 KSI. And this is the first thing here. P ultimate over area uh, gross, which is 25 KSI. And F field, it is 50 KSI. This is given for, for us also. So we have 25 and we have a field 50. Okay, first of all, we are going to have FCR inelastic. We're going to calculate it by ourselves. So it is going to be P ultimate over area gross, which is given for us 25. And we are going to add this VC, which is 0.9. So it is going to be 25 over 0.9. It gives us 27.78. Okay, then we are going to equate this compressive FCR inelastic with the compressive strength. This is the compressive strength here. We are going to equate it with this equation that is provided by AISC. AISC. We have F field. It is 50. Known here, known here. Then we can obtain FE only. Okay. So from this equation, we can obtain FE to be 35.61 KSI. Based on that, so after like if we like substitute with F field 50 and 50 here, then FE only the only unknown we can obtain FE 35.61.
Then FCR elastic, it is elastic, not inelastic. I think this is a mistake in the textbook. So this is the elastic one. It is going to be 0.877 F yield. So it is going to be, uh, sorry, FE, which is already we have explained or we have obtained before. Okay, so it is going to be 0.877, okay, times 35.61, which it gives to us 31.23 KSI. So the stiffness reduction factor in this case, it is going to be, the ratio between FCR inelastic over FCR elastic. This is the ratio between the two. So FCR inelastic over FCR elastic. This is tau alpha. 27 over 31 and gives us 0.89. What is the meaning of 0.89? It means that we are the stiffness reduction factor that is going to be used to reduce to reduce g elastic we are going to multiply it by 0.89 this means that we are going to reduce by almost 11 percent our our inelastic column is going to uh, have reduction in stiffness by 11 percent okay okay so this is actually this is the very simple example that we can use and we uh, that we can see and we use our calculation okay so what about that if we are going to use the table for example so let's have another example that is a little bit longer and we are going to see how we can see or how we can uh, use the uh, the tables okay so let's read this example together a rigid unbraised so this is number one something key word here unbraised frame this means that if we're going to use the alignment chart we are going to use the case of uh, sway permitted it's shown in this figure as you can see this is the figure everything is given for us it is the span is given and the heights are given even the points that we are going to consider the uh, as the end of the column that is under consideration okay it is a and b given for us the cross section is given so everything is clear and given for us all members are oriented so that bending is about the strong axis uh, so bending always in the strong axis so it seems that all the members like oriented in this way for example if we like take a cross section here it is going to be in this way lateral support is provided at each joint by simply connected bracing in the direction perpendicular to the frame so this means that perpendicular to the frame it is braced all the points are braced why we want this or why it is needed to be given here because this is giving to us a piece of information and telling us that out out of plane which is normal to this screen out of plane buckling length of the columns is going to be the same as it is so the effective length factor is going to be exactly one it is out of plane means that perpendicular to the white page but in 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 plane buckling length is going to be calculated okay because it is sway permitted uh, frame okay determine the effective length factors with respect to each axis for member ab so we are we have chosen this member which is ab to examine to determine the effective length factors okay with respect to each axis for this member the service load the service dead load is 35.5 kips and the service live load is 142 caps and a 992 steel is used means that our F yield is 50 KSI okay now let's go to the computation of uh, the ratios which is G factors and then we are going to check whether the column is elastic or inelastic okay we are going to check this so the steps the steps of the design is going to be like this. We are going to, uh, or the, the steps of the solution is going to be like this. We are going to calculate G for joint A and joint B, assuming that this column or AB is going to be elastic. And then we are going to check the column, whether it is elastic or inelastic column. If it's inelastic, we are going to 
like further calculate tau alpha based on the procedure that we have explained before and then we're going to reduce our k that we have obtained in the case of elastic g g's okay okay now this is the procedure let's go and see how we're going to do this first of all for joint a we have we need to calculate ic over lc over ig over lg so the summation of column inertia over the girder inertia everything is given please stop the video go to the properties table calculate these values by yourself in order to train yourself using the tables okay so we're going to find that 171 over 12 this is the length of the columns here 12 and the length of girders are 20 and 80 20 that's right and 80 like left and right and for w14 by 22 and w14 by 22 these are the girders on the bottom and for the top at point a it is w12 by 14 and 12 by 14 okay they are going to be th the same and this is right as you can see they are the same here so the ratio gives us 1.52 in a similar fashion we're going to use this for join b and we are going to obtain 1.36 1.52 and 1.36 then we are going to the alignment chart the alignment charts okay so in the alignment charts we are going to use the side sway not prevented this is unbraised column so and we are going to use 1.52 and 1.36 1.52 here for example okay 1.52 and 1. Point, sorry 1.36 so 1.36 here almost so we are we are here i think that we are here so we're going to find that from the alignment chart for unbraised we are talking about unbraised as we said kx is almost like 1.4 as we have mentioned kx is going to be 1.4 based on elastic behavior remember that this is we are assuming now elastic behavior we do not know whether the column is going to be elastic or inelastic we have no idea we need to check this now determine whether the column behavior is elastic or inelastic now this is the second step for us second step in our solution so we're going to check kx over kxl over rx for the column and we are going to check the limit between the elastic and inelastic uh, column behavior so for elastic and inelastic limit 4.71 times the radical of e over f field a field is given e is 29,000 case i this is 113 this is the limit and kxl over rx for our case it is going to be 49.83 it is much less so in our column if you remember it was something like like this this is the limit here is 113 and our case is here 49 point something so we are in the inelastic range so as long as kx l over rx less than our proportional limit this means that we are in the inelastic range the column behavior is inelastic and inelastic k factor can be used okay then for lrfd solution we are going to start with we want the compressive stress so we are going to start with p ultimate that is given for us this is remember here in the example it is they are giving us the service dead load okay and the service live load what is the reason for this the reason is to calculate p ultimate for the calculation of the compressive stress after that okay so the p ultimate is going to be 1.2 dead plus 1.6 life and this provides 269.8 caps then enter table 4-21 in part 4 of the manual this is the tau alpha table that we have had before with with compressive stress p ultimate over area gross p ultimate is already provided here and area gross it is provided for us from the cross section that we have we have the cross section w10 right by 33 
go to the properties table and you are going to obtain this value, the area gross. The ratio is going to be 27.7. Okay, then we are going into the table, which is table 4 21 and get tau alpha. Let's go to the table. This is the table 4 21 tau alpha. And we are going to find for F yield equal to 50. And for LRFD, P ultimate over area gross without the resistance factor here, 27 point something. We are here, right? Then under the column LRFD for 50 KSI, we are going down here. Okay, down here. Until that, we are going to find these two values, 0 0.804 to 0.835. Interpolation is going to be used here. And based on this, we're going to find our tau alpha is 0.8105 by interpolation. Then for joint A, simply we're going to multiply tau alpha by G elastic, which was 1.5 before. And for joint B, it is going to be 0.18 times 1.36, which was obtained under the elastic behavior, or this is G elastic, it gives us 1.1. Now from the alignment chart, you are going to find that our Kx is going to be 1.35 based on these two. Okay, you are going to find it. So let's go to the alignment chart. It is less now. So we are having, sorry, we are having 1.23 and 1.1. 1.23 and 1.1 here almost so we are having something here so as they are providing it it is going to be 1.36 before before we have uh, obtained the value to be 1.45 now after considering the uh, inelastic behavior it is going to be 1.35 so we reduced it from 1.4 K was 1.4 for K elastic. Now for K in elastic, it is going to be 1.35. So we have reduction of this value. Okay. Because of the support conditions normal to the frame, KY can be taken as one. Actually, the in the example, they asked us determine the effective length factor with respect to each axis. Means that uh, normal to the frame plane and in the frame plane. So in the frame plane already we have like calculated everything here, but in the uh, out of plane it is given for us lateral support is provided at each joint by simply connected connected bracing in the direction perpendicular to the frame. So as long as there is a bracing in this uh, con uh, in this direction which is perpendicular to the uh, to the plane of the frame, then k is going to be one in this case. K is going to be one, but in the plane of the frame, it is unbraced frame. So we need to go into all this story of calculations. Okay. So the last thing that I want to talk about is related to the torsional and flexural torsional buckling, torsional and flexural torsional buckling. Okay. Other types of mode failures. So when an axially loaded compression member becomes unstable, Okay. Overall, that is not locally unstable. I'm talking about the global failure behavior. Okay. It can buckle in one of three ways, as shown. So this is considered to be like global buckling behavior. And this global buckling behavior is can be considered as we call it as flexural buckling, one type called flexural buckling. Other type we call it torsional buckling and the third type we call it flexural torsional buckling now let's understand what is the difference between these uh, phenomena okay first of all global buckling based on flexural buckling means that the cross section the whole cross section is going to move laterally as you can see with this shape with the dashed shape here okay however in the case of the torsional buckling so we are going to find that the shape is going to like go in this way torsional this is torsional buckling it will not go outside here it is going to revolve around the center itself this is what we call it torsional buckling 
and the third one is going to be a combination of the two so this is what we call it flexural torsional buckling the element is going to go translation or go laterally as you can see here with the dashed line and in the same time it is going to rotate so this is three different types of global failure failure behavior of the column Okay, we're going to talk in, in detail about, about each one, okay, without going into the equations, because rarely actually we can find other types of failure, especially these two failures. They are not going to be commonly encountered, especially in case of purely compression members, okay? It is special cases. I'm going to talk about them in a minute. So for global flexural buckling, as we said, uh, we have considered this type of buckling up up to now what we have studied up till now it is based on flexural buckling okay it is a deflection caused by bending or flexure about the axis corresponding to the largest slenderness ratio okay this is this this one okay the slender which is we have like like here this is x and this is y so the flexure is going to take uh, this global flexure around the like weak axis okay which is going to be yy for example this is usually the minor principal axis the one with the smallest radius of gyration as we know compression members with any type of cross-sectional configuration can fail in this way so this is the most commonly encountered failure mode that we have okay the next one is the torsional buckling okay this type of failure is caused by twisting about the longitudinal axis of the member. It can occur only with doubly symmetrical cross sections with very slender cross section cross sectional elements. Okay, that's very that's the point why it is rare. Okay, standard hot rolled shapes are not susceptible to torsional buckling but members built up from thin plates, that's the point, this is the key word here, thin plates, okay, are going to be susceptible to this failure mode. That is, uh, fortunately, that is hot rolled shapes, which is commonly are going to be used in our case, they are not susceptible to this um, buckling, this torsional buckling uh, failure mode, okay, only thin plate okay, elements may be and should be investigated, okay? The circumferm shape shown is particularly vulnerable to this type of buckling. This shape can be fabricated from plates as shown in the figure or built up, maybe built up from four angles placed back to back. So whenever that we have something like this, like star shape, and they are made of thin plates, then you should be worried and you need to check them. But if you are taking or you are working with hot roll shapes, then don't worry about this failure mode. The last one is the flexural torsional buckling. And this type of failure is caused by a combination of flexural buckling and torsional buckling. The members bends and twists simultaneously. This type of failure can occur only with unsymmetrical cross sections. So remember, this is a key word here, unsymmetrical cross sections both the those with one axis of symmetry such as channels structural t's double angle shapes and equal leg single angles and those with no axis of symmetry such as unequal leg and single unequal single legs yes so this is in case of like with unsymmetrical cross sections in general which is also not the common case for for us okay so we have Again, remember the failure modes that is going to be for our compression member. We are focusing our study up till now on this one. However, the other two should be investigated in some special cases. The last thing for <clears throat> our today's video is the failure modes of compression member in general. So we have like global buckling, which is already I have talked about three different types of it. And then we have local buckling which is going to be something similar to this. This is local buckling here. And then the third one is the connection failure, which is related to the connection itself, as, as we can see here, for example, for this, for this element here in reality. So we have overall buckling, 
like this is like flexural, for example, we have three different types of it. So this is buckling of the entire column, or we have other two types as we have explained before. And we have local buckling, which is this one. And we have connection failure, which is the failure of the connection itself. We are going to talk about connections later. Local buckling, we are going to talk about the compact and non-compact and slender elements and buckling of the entire columns. This is already we have explained up till now and we mentioned about the flexural buckling. Okay, thank you. This is the end of this video. I hope that you have understood everything that I've explained today. It's very important uh, video, I guess. It gives you an exposure to the failure modes of the column or compression uh, elements. And I hope that you have an idea of how to distinguish between the different types of failure modes and what is the different types of global flexural uh, uh, type or global failure modes. Before that, we were talking about the inelastic column uh, charts. By this uh, video, we have ended columns, compression members, I mean, and then we are going to talk later after that, we are going to talk about the uh, uh, next uh, topic, which is related to beams. Uh, I hope that until then, I hope that you can stop the video, pause the video at different steps and try to like learn more by going and using your manual and trying to find more information about what I have said, whether in the textbook or in the solved examples in the manual. And I hope that this video helps you to understand more. Thank you very much and see you in the next uh, video.